Okay, students, good afternoon. Time is here. I hope you had a nice weekend. Yeah, no uh, obvious. So we were working in chapter three. We didn't finish that one completely, I seem to recall. Uh, so let's continue. Um, uh, I put up a little uh, message here on the front, I think. Let's have a look. Um, uh, yeah, where do I maybe? No, I don't want to delete it. I want to watch it. Yeah. Uh, it says here uh, we're heading exercise set one next week on Thursday, September 18th. I will run through exercise set one. Hence, it's sensible to spend some time on uh, looking at these exercises. Today, Monday, September 8th, I will spend some time investigating the classroom exercise C exercises. So if you look into the exercises here, um, there is this one, which I will. Uh, run through next week so as I said in the message here it's a good idea to look at it before that time and later on we will look at this uh, this one uh, in class today I think uh, but before we reach that step we need to finish up um, chapter 3 okay so let's start we looked at this uh, last time we looked at this last time uh, obviously, <coughs> we can turn this around if we want to express this equation with a single C on the left hand side. That's straightforward as well, isn't it? Uh, let's just do that because we may need it later on here. So we start with uh, a general version of a budget constraint with two prices, Pf and Pc, where F is the quantity of this good F. It's called food here. Pc is the price of clothes. Pf is the price of food. Uh, and C is the quantity of uh, clothes. And that should equal the amount of uh, money available. Of course, we don't assume that you can borrow money in this economy here. Okay, yeah. That is, of course, in reality an option, but uh, that is kind of just making a, a small change in, in the theory. Uh, here we can kind of solve this with respect to F. Let's do the same with respect to C. So let's solve it with respect to C. So we want to have C isolated on the left hand side. So uh, we start by taking the terms which do not contain a C on the right hand side. That leaves PC times C left on the left hand side. We keep the i, and of course we have to change the sign on this one. So it looks like this, and in order to isolate the c, we just divide by pc here. So c is i over pc minus pf over pc multiplied by f. So this is, in principle of course, exactly the same expression as this one, and this one, and this one. It's just writing the same expression in different ways and there is a reason for this here and the reason shows up here because you see on these figures here there is clothing on the second axis clothing on the second axis and we have food on the first axis and we when we want to draw a function we always isolate the variable on the left hand side which should be on the second axis okay so now it's a correspondence between this expression and these figures, okay, that was the idea. And then we started to discuss these figures last time, we didn't finish completely, so let's do that today. Um, <coughs> there are two situations we look at here. One situation where we change income, that is figure 311. The other situation where we change one of the prices, in this case the price on the first axis, the food price, and we look at the consequences on the virtual constraint by doing these two operations. And as I more or less said last time, it should be straightforward. Um, if we 
want to draw a general line of this type, then we do two steps. The first step is to put this variable equal to zero. Okay? So given this one now, the star equation, the version which we have named star here, we can put f equal to zero to find one crossing point and as you probably know it's enough to find two crossing points to draw a straight line okay so that's the reason why we deal with this and if f is, c is zero in this equation of course this part vanishes so we end up with c equal to i divided by pc so this one produces c equal to i over pc okay that is one crossing point, and that is the crossing point on the c axis, isn't it? c has a value here. f is zero valued when we move along this axis. That is, of course, the consequence of putting f equal to zero. The other crossing point with the first axis is formed by putting the whole expression to zero. So i over pc minus pf over pc times f should be equated to zero and sold with respect to f and that is straightforward uh, maybe easiest to take this part on the right hand side that produces i over pc on the left hand side and we change the sign to a plus here so that's convenient to do here and then we can isolate f on the right hand side that doesn't matter okay whether we isolate it on the right hand side or the left hand side that doesn't matter so in order to achieve that we can multiply with the inverse fraction here can't we so pc over p f in that case pf is reduced against pf and pc is re reduced against this pc on the left hand side so f is isolated and then of course we have to multiply this one with the remaining part on the left hand side and we see, don't we, that PC can be re reduced against PC on top, so we're left with I divided by PF. So this produces the following equation, F equals to I divided by PF, doesn't it? This is the second crossing point, this is the first crossing point, okay? Are you following? No, Matt, if you, find, if you can't see behind there, there's a lot of space in front here, okay? The computer. The computer. Well, I, I got an answer. I can... Uh, maybe if I put it uh, in this direction, then uh, there's somebody else who's suffering. <laughs> that guy, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I need to kind of write here, because if I write too much there, then it won't appear on the movie. So there is some constraints here okay uh, and of course now if we draw this in this diagram we know here that the distance with the crossing point with the c axis is given by this amount so there is one crossing point another one there and this distance is this one, isn't it? I over PC, while this distance is this one, I over PF. Of course, then we can draw the budget constraint. Now, on these figures, we ask a different question, okay? We ask, what will happen if we change one of the variables? So, on the left-hand side, we make a change in the income. So if the income increases here, we get more income, then what happens? Of course, this i increases something, but this i also increases something, doesn't it? So we get a similar change in the top of this fraction as well as in the top of that fraction. Meaning that we have to move this one a certain distance and this one the same distance. So we get a new parallel line here for a different i. If this is i1 and this is i2 then we must assume mustn't we that i2 should be larger than i1 and of course we can draw as many as we like in this figure we can draw 
long in that or under. Of course, if it's under, it's the other way of this inequality. So a change in the income leads to a par parallel shift in the budget constraint. The other situation, which turns out to be interesting, is to change one of the prices. In this case, the price on the first axis, the price on food. So this is a change in income. Then we get these consequences. Now if we change the price on the first axis, the price of food, of course again we have to look at these crossing points. What will happen with these crosses, crossing points when we change the price? This one does not change, does it? It does not contain PF. So this is kept, kept steady. So this point is fixed. What about this point? If we change PF, if we increase P P PF, what will happen to the fraction? It goes down. It will be decreased. Okay, so we move in that direction then. Okay, if we move the other direction, we have to decrease PF. So the situation where we have a, a change in in pf we can do it small here in order not to get out of the boundaries okay then this point is fixed and of course the point crossing the first line will change so we get something like this won't we yeah if this is the starting price then we could infer by our argument now that p1 should be smaller than p0, shouldn't it? That was the point. When we increase this number, the fraction is smaller. So the opposite, you get a lower price to move in that direction. If you move in that direction, you get a higher price. You agree? You see it on the, on the figure here as well. So by changing a single price, this, constra this budget constraint kind of rotates on this point here. Is this clear? Okay, good. Then we move to the point here, at least a uh, sidestepping point because these will be used not here but later on. Okay. <coughs> Okay, now what are we interested in here? We're interested in trying to find the amount of food and the amount of clothing that a single consumer is interested in buying given these premises, given that we have prices on each of the goods, that we have an income on the customer hand, and finally, given that we have the preferences of the customer. And the preferences are described by this concept of a utility function. So this utility function defines the preferences. Uh, put other otherwise, what kind of trade-off would this consumer inherit related to these two goods? Okay. How much food he is interested in giving up to get one more unit of clothing or vice versa? And this function, as we have discussed previously, can be described by these indifference curves. Okay, these indifference curves are curves stating a constant utility for the consumer. And the assumption underlying is, of course, that the consumer is greedy and he or she wants to maximize this utility. And the question is then, how can we arrive at that maximal solution? How can we solve this optimization problem? And the textbook uh, kind of more or less uh, describes two different ways. This is the first one, a kind of graphical solution method. And uh, the logic is quite simple. Okay. Of course, we can do this mathematically as well, but we will return, return to that later on. Now, this budget constraint. Now, 
what about the consumer who kind of uses this amount of his budget? Is that a happy consumer? You say no. Who said no? Oh, yeah. Why? Why is he unhappy? Because his income budget is that much. And uh, at that point, uh, he's buying less clothes and less food. So he's not his maximum. Of yeah, he can get more utility, can't he? If he kind of yes. moves up here yeah. or if he moves over there, yeah. he gets from this point to this point, he keeps the same amount of this axis. It's clothes, by the way, isn't it? Uh, <coughs> but he gets more of clothes by this in this transformation. Moving there from there to there, of course, he gets more food, and of course, he can move there as well. But of course, there's really nothing make it impossible for a consumer to stay inside this area. Okay, so it's possible for a consumer to be in here. So this area here kind of, kind of defines the options for the consumer. We tend to call have this call a name have a name for this. In economic theory, we call it the feasibility set. So this is kind of where it's feasible for a consumer to make his decisions. But given that we know he's greedy, we can already kind of state that he will kind of be on this line. You agree? Because he's greedy, he wants to kind of utilize his money. But the normally we kind of do it like this. But we, we already know now that this line, the actual budget line, will contain the solution. And that will contain the solution of his utility maximization problem. Because as long as this we have this sensible transformation into a utility function, he gets more utility in this point than in this point. He gets more utility than in this point than in this point. And any kind of choice here, we can do the same argument. Okay? And all these choices will end on this budget line. The only thing we've used here is greed as well as the budget contract. That's the only two arguments we use to decide that the consumer will be on this line. But we're a little bit more detailed here. We really want to find a single point on this line. And to be able to determine that single point, we need to look at the utility function. Now, if I draw a certain indifference line here, yeah, we can call it I1, and it has the utility 1 associated with it. What we know about this line is that it has a certain utility. It's here called U1. We also know that at any point of this uh, indifference curve, uh, the consumer is indifferent. Indif so he's just as happy if he's here or here or here or wherever pl place. Okay. The problem with this indifference curve is that in this case, the consumer can't reach it, can he? Because it's outside his feasible space. The same, of course, with another one, this one, even worse. Although utility is higher here, you can't reach that one either. This one, you can reach, can't you? However, there should be an indifference curve at some other point here, which kind of gives higher utility than, than this one, shouldn't it? Maybe this one. Well, that one, I star. That is kind of the indifference curve that produces the highest utility for the consumer. And of course, that exact point where this indifference curve hits this straight line, we tend to use the, the term tangent, to, don't we? When we have a function that hits a line, it kind of just hits it. That is the solution to the consumer's optimization problem. So the amount of f, we tend to put a star on it here and see, is the solution to this problem, isn't it? That produces the highest utility for the consumer in this case. So you see, this utility maximization problem, as we tend to call it, depends on the prices in the economy. It depends on the available income, that is p, c, and p, f, and i as well as the shape of the utility function, how it is, it is shaped. Of course, when I draw one of these indifference curves, it's linked to how the utility function is kind of working for this consumer. So this kind of, this set of inf information determines the optimal solution. 
So why do we want to do this? Of course, the reason is that we want to use this in order to derive something. And what we're aiming for here is to derive the demand curve. So far, we haven't seen that link, but it comes fairly soon, Okay, in the next chapter, I think. OK, if we don't like to draw these graphs, we can do this mathematically. But in order to do it mathematically, we need a mathematical specification of the utility function. Okay? We need some kind of formula, which normally is given to us. Of course, economic theory is filled with experiments where people are kind of being put in some kind of artificial situation. And you ask questions like, OK, here we have some shoes, and there we have some ties. And, and you try to ask them questions to derive this function. That, that's obviously possible. Unfortunately, it's uh, time-consuming as well as not necessarily correct, because you probably know that preferences are something which certain consumers would like to hide. And or it may be that artificial experiments do not reveal these preferences. Okay? You need to do it in the real world. Uh, it's perhaps more easier to see if you look at another dimension of utility problems in economic theory or uncertain utility in situations where there are uncertainty. Uh, and it's one thing to sit at a computer screen betting fake money on something. Okay, It's a different thing to bet real money, isn't it? If you are really betting the money. And this difference kind of also emerges in this situation. So it's not necessarily straightforward to derive these utility functions, although at least theoretically it should be possible. OK, let's look at the mathematical version of the same problem. OK, this is just another way of doing the same. Of course, it gets more accurate normally, uh, unless you have a computer to draw this stuff. Uh, even then, it gets more exact and in some cases it's necessary okay so we need to look at it <coughs> okay i will just look at an example here this is a graphical version next up is a mathematical version And in this case, uh, in this example, at least we do it a little bit simpler. Okay, we don't look at general prices here. We have numbers for the prices here. So if you look at equation two, there you see that P F is assumed to be one here. There is a one in front of F, and P C, the price of clothes, is given as two. Okay, and there is an income here. How how large is the income in this example? Anybody tell me that? I heard something. Eighty. Correct. I equals 80. You see that from the budget constraints, don't you? In general, it's PF in front here. That must be 1. PC, that must be 2. And I is 80. Okay. So that is the information we need. But we also need the shape of the utility function. In this case, it is in equation 1. Okay. So the U of FC is a two-variable function, as you can see. And it's given very easily here as the product between f and c, not to make the mathematics too tough. What's the st you mean? fc? No, the st. st. Mm -hmm. Before the f. Yeah, I will return to that. OK. OK, now I will just collect all the information I have. OK, now I have the following information. I have my utility function, and I want to maximize that. Don't I? That was the idea. I want to try the highest amount of utility the consumer can get. So I put the max in front of my utility function. But it must be subject to. That's the meaning of st mat. st means subject to. Because I know that the consumer must be on this budget line. So we tend to formulate these optimization problems by using the term subject to, which is abbreviated ST. 
and in this case it should be f plus 2c r equals equals 80. So this is a full mathematical formulation of the problem we solved here. Okay. Of course, then we need to know how to solve these types of optimization problems. And in general, that's not straightforward. Luckily, in this case, it's actually fairly easy. And the reason is the structure here. Okay. What this means, of course, is in a sense that we have, we can try to think about this geometrically, can't we? This is a two variable function. It's some kind of, of um, space which kind of folds out here in one way or the other. I don't really know how to draw it. It's a maybe something like this, okay? Perhaps it's going down here so you can see inside it, okay? And then we know that we must be on this line, which actually is a plane in this three-dimensional space. So this is like a piece of paper, okay, which we cut through this conic kind of thing here. And depending on the numbers here, this plane is skewed in one or the other direction. So if you think about something which goes down like this, you put a piece of paper in through it, there will be a kind of circle back. Do you agree? And we're trying to find the top of this circle. That's what we're doing here, really. So you can think about an ice cream cone or something. We take a piece of paper, put through it in the cor correct angle based on these two and this one. And then what's remaining is, of course, some kind of cut through that. And then we're trying to find the top point on that cut through. That's exactly what we do. <laughs> if you feel for a kind of geometrical feeling here, not everybody finds that very comforting. So I don't think I'll spend more time on that. The point here is straightforward. This one holds, okay? So we can take this equation and we can solve for one of the variables, can't we? We can say, for instance, that f equals 80, and then of course we have 2c and put on the right hand side with a minus. And this expression we can put back into this function f times c. The reason uh, we, we, we often do this is that most students know that if you have some kind of function in a two-dimensional plane, you know that the derivative of that function produces a stationary point. And among these stationary points, the maximum value would be. In this case, it should be here, shouldn't it? So we can kind of transform our problem from a two-variable problem into a single-variable problem by using this information. Now, of course, we can write or optimization problem as this. And now suddenly this f variable is not there anymore, okay? Because we substitute this in for f there. So we're over to a single variable problem. So it's suddenly just a c in here, and we keep, we substitute this f with 80 minus c. Should it be c? It should be 2c, shouldn't it? like this. And of course we have to multiply with the c which is left here, which is that one. Now we can compute this, can't we? Multiply this c in these parentheses. We get, get 80c minus 2c squared. This is a single variable function, given that we know now that we can take the derivative of this one, aiming for the optimal or maximal solution, then we just do that. So we can just take the derivative of this function, which is 80 times c. The derivative of that part is 80, isn't it? And then the derivative of this one, then we know, need to know this rule. If f of x, I briefly looked at it in the mathematical start here. Let's say it's c times x to the power n, then the derivative is n times c times x to the power n minus 1. We can apply this rule here, can't we? This is the constant, this is the n. So we take the constant, 2, multiply it with c, and we have to take 2 minus 1 in the top power here. And of course, then we end with 80 minus 
2 times 2, shouldn't it? Yeah. 4c. Finally, of course, we have to equate the derivative to 0 to find these points. So we equate this to 0, keep on solving, and we end up with c star as 80 over 4, which is 20, isn't it? Yeah. So the optimal amount of clothing this consumer would buy would be 20 units of clothing. We can also find the amount of F, can't we? By simply entering this into the budget constraints. Now we know the amount of C. It's 40. No, 20. <laughs> 2 times 20 is 40. We have to subtract it for 80, so we end up with the optimal amount of F to be 40, as is written on the PowerPoint there. So our final solution looks like this. C star equals 20 and F star equals 40. So what did we do? Okay, the idea is that of course that you need to get a feeling for why we do this. And so far I haven't given you the answer, basically. Yes? Um, we just uh, um, know at the max UOC as a natural number. And uh, because uh, the natural number's derivation can... Natural number? Natural, just a one, two, three, four. This kind of number. Oh, you see. Yeah. OK. So it should be an integer. We haven't defined this, have we? You say it should be one, two, three, four, five. And, uh, yes. But why, why should that be? Um, because we can buy food in kilograms, can't we? If, if the derivation of uh, just uh, like a f of x, it can't be equal to zero. We just uh, uh, put as, uh, as a max UOC as a normal number, as the derivation can be zero. I think it's called natural number. Is that what you mean, that it should not, should not be 1.3, for instance? Is that your point? The of the, the differentiation of you see? Uh, uh, equal zero. Yeah? Yeah. Why you know the definition? Why how I know that I will find these points if the derivative is zero? Yeah. Yeah, but that's uh, is zero, it's just a you know when you take the derivative of a function you actually find this tangent here. Okay? Here it has a positive value. Here it has a positive value. But if you come at this top point it looks like this. And here this derivative is zero. That's just how it is, okay? I don't plan to explain to you this because this is kind of basic math, okay? Yeah. I, if you don't believe me, you can calculate the derivative, put in different values for x, and at some point you will see that it's zero here, okay? So that, that's just straightforward basic optimization, okay? The derivative of a function equals to zero produces either these type of points, maximal points, or these type of points. Because the same holds here. The tangent is, what do you call it? Horizontal? Yeah. I would assume you should have learned that in some courses sometime. Uh, but OK, just take that, OK? That's how it is. In order to solve an optimization, pr uh, I'm slightly surprised. Now if you go back to what we started with here, let's do that. Not here. Maybe here. If you go to the added material, if you, you, may, you may recall that we started with this one. Remember? Uh, 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 and at some point here, we started uh, discussing the defini definition of derivatives. Do you remember that? Uh, maybe down here, 
here okay and we also said here didn't we that all stationary points are obtainable by solving the, the derivative of x equals zero you see that we, we went through this in the first lecture this is what we apply here isn't it if we solve the equation here we find this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point for that function. That's exactly what we do here. Okay. What, what I did here was to avoid the problem of having a dual variable function, because that's kind of hard to see. So I used the information <coughs> of the budget constraint. I solved it with respect to one of the variables. I plugged that in to the original function. So I ended up with a transformed function which has only a single variable. Then we're back to this situation here. And then I equated that to zero. If that was your question, here. And then, I of course, I found the solutions. At this point, you really don't know, do you, whether this is a maximal point or a minimal point. In order to check that, you need to calculate the second derivatives and look at the sign of those. But then we're kind of moving too far into optimization theory, which of course is not the point here. We try to look at the economic part of this. Now, did I answer your question? Did you get an answer? Okay, okay. Good. So, where were we? This was the last one in chapter 3, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah. Would I be justified to express myself graphically rather than mathematically? That depends on the question, doesn't it? If you're asked to find something precisely, then it's perhaps better to do it mathematically. In some cases, you have to do it mathematically. In other cases, it's sufficient to do it graphically. So this is uh, something I leave for you, okay? Your judgment regarding the situation we are in. If you, if you don't know, of course, you can do both, can't you? That's an option you always have. But in general, uh, I would hope that you kind of are able to investigate what situation you are in when we look at these exercises, and uh, then use uh, the, the way which is natural. Of course, if you feel more comfortable doing things graphically, maybe that's a good idea, at least as a starting point, to try to get the feeling for where you should end up. And then, of course, you can do it mathematically to control whether your intuition or your graphical analysis seems sensible. Other questions? So you really haven't seen these kind of theory before? <coughs> or uh, maybe a little bit? Uh, yeah. Some is nodding carefully um, here. But this is really not the point here. Okay, this is just the starting point. We haven't kind of used it for what we really want to use it for yet. But we, we, this is kind of a necessary step in between. So do you find this difficult? It seems like you do, okay. Then we have to take it easy, okay. Okay, let me try to recapture kind of the, the main contents of this chapter. An indifference curve is a curve where utility is given. Okay, we took we, we gave an example on on how to calculate one. Here is an example on how to calculate this indifference curve to, to kind of make it visible for you. You just, of course, in, in that case, you also need this utility function, which is the same here as it was in the later example. And then the idea is just to put this f times c equal to something. In this case, equal to 25. And then solve for one of the variables. And then in an fc diagram, you can draw, draw this curve. Here is uh, an example where three of these curves have been drawn. One for 100, one for 50, and one for 25 for these different constant utility numbers. So the idea here was to introduce this indifference curve concept. And the reason why we do that is, of course, that we kind of needed, needed those to make these arguments, didn't we? 
we need to have these indifference curves to be able to make this argument which graphically produce the solution to our optimization problem. That was also kind of a, a step ahead uh, on, on the way. And then we introduced this budget line, which of course also is needed to produce this one. Then we discussed how to draw any kind of general budget line or an example here. Okay. Where you need to be able to manipulate these letters here in a correct way. If you miss that, then everything goes wrong. Okay? So in order to, to handle this from a technical point of view, you need to be able to both handle fractions, handle equations, and keep track of everything. Okay? It's more a matter of being accurate than, be, than being intelligent, so to speak. <coughs> then we discussed what effect we would get on the budget line if we changed either income on the left, a parallel shift, or a change in one of the prices, in this case the price of food, and if income increased, our budget line moved outwards, outwards in the diagram. If the price increased, the rotation was the other way around, okay? We start out here and increase the price, then we rotate it inwards. Here is price a half, one and two. And we argued in general why it should be like that. Then finally we started with this example here. And then we took a version where we use mathematics. Of course, in order to do that, you need to know that the derivative can be computed. You need to know how to compute the derivative. And you also need to be able to solve the equation when putting the derivative to zero. That produces a whole set of such stationary points in general, but in these cases produced only a single point. Remember here? We got this equation here, okay? There's only one solution to this one. The question then is, of course, whether this function looks like this or like this, doesn't it? If this is the case, then we find this point. That's not what we're looking for. This is the point we're looking for, actually. It turns out in this case that this is correct, okay? This is how this shape looks. If you doubt me, you can just draw it, draw this curve here, sorry, this one. If you draw this curve in the diagram, it will look something like this. Sometimes this can go wrong, okay? Have anybody oh you heard about an airplane made by the Americans called the F-19 stealth fighter? You haven't? Let's see if you can find uh, an example on the internet here. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see. It's a... Uh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Uh, here's perhaps the most classical example. Have you seen these planes before? Yeah. You know what they're used for? They are used to kill people, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> or destroy buildings, or preferably both, okay? You know that uh, wha what this term stealth means? Do you know what it means? Stealth means that it is not visible on radar. Okay, so you by ingenious construction of the surface here, by making certain angles, you kind of end up, if you do this right, in a situation where the radar kind of is deflected and you can't see it. What's the, what's the reason for doing that, do you think? you're always afraid of being shot down. So you, you kind of minimize, minimize that risk if you enter a situation where the enemy can't see you, okay? That's kind of obvious. The problem with this is that when you construct this plane, it turns out that these stealth abilities, they are a trade-off related to the flying experience of the plane. So you can there are actually two dimensions here. You can kind of get more stealth abilities, less visibility on radar, but you have to sacrifice something. You have to sacrifice the plane's ability to fly. So you can kind of get a situation where you construct it very invisible, but it simply can't fly. That's not much of a point, is it? 
So depending on what you're maximizing here, okay? Suppose you maximize uh, uh, suppose you want a certain amount of stealth, okay? You want a certain amount of invisibleness, stealth, and then you want to maximize the firing characteristics. It turns out that when they first constructed this plane, they did that, but they ended up with minimizing the firing abilities. So the first version of this plane was relatively invisible on radar, but uh, it couldn't fly. Do you know what they had to do then? Of course, they had to put hundreds of computers into the plane to make it fly, okay? Every kind of small movement would kind of <coughs> kill it straight to the ground. So they had to have a very fine-tuned system of computers to make it actually fly. That was expensive, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really expensive. So if they had kind of done the optimization correctly, then they would uh, hopefully made it much cheaper. Of course, modern versions, uh, they kind of made this ri right. But you see uh, kind of how, how important it is to kind of find the right point here. Whether you find the maximum point or the minimum point actually means something. Okay, it's time for a break.